Hey, Life Science, we're going to continue with Kingdom Protista. Last time we talked about subkingdom protozoa, which means this time we're going to talk about subkingdom algae. Now, if you remember, protozoans were kind of like the microscopic animal-ish creatures. Well, that means that algae are the microscopic plant-ish creatures. So some major facts about algae. First, they are an important food source for many aquatic organisms. That's to be expected um, because plants are the bottom of the food chain up on land. Um, it's pretty similar down in the ocean. They are used as food and other uses by humans. We'll talk about some of those um, as we get more specific. They also usually live in colonies rather than individual algae cells, they usually live in colonies. And when they do, um, they have what's called a thallus, which is the body of a plant-like organism that is not divided into leaves, roots, or stems. That's a characteristic of plants is that they have different body sections like that, but um, a colony of algae would not. An algal bloom refers to rapid reproduction of algae such that they dominate the habitat. Um, this would be like some algae that starts out in some population and then the conditions are right so that the algae can grow and they grow so quickly and so pervasively that they overwhelm the habitat and uh, they can actually um, kill everything else there. So um, yeah, that's fun. Let's move on. We're going to talk about some specific phyla of algae and here's phylum chlorophyta. They are found mostly in fresh water and they are green algae, which means that they contain chlorophyll. And their cell walls are made of cellulose. Um, so here's a nice couple images of green algae, chlorophyta. So if we were to talk about genus chlorella, they are unicellular. They are not living in colonies. I mentioned before that they usually live in colonies, but it's, it's not universal. And uh, they are also often symbiotic. Um, so if we're talking about green algae that lives in freshwater, we're probably talking about the kind of algae that you see on ponds or that you have to clean out of your pool. So here's uh, some more examples of phylum chlorophyta. This would be genus Desmid, and they have the appearance of two halves pinched in the middle. Some more out of phylum chlorophyta. Um, this is genus Spirogyra. They are they have spiral chloroplasts. Um, if you look closely, obviously this is under a microscope, so you're not getting a a view that you're maybe used to. But it looks like there's a cross section, almost like the footprint of a slinky in there. Those are spiral chloroplasts, and they form colonies of slender chain-like threads of cells. Um, you can see they kind of look like uh, threads of bricks. Um, those are chain-like, I don't know, just exactly how it says it, threads of cells. Um, these colonies are called filaments, and they can reach up to two feet long. Of course, they're still microscopically thin, but they can become very long. Here's another phylum. These would not be green algae, as you can tell from this picture. Phylum chrysophyta. So a good example of chrysophytes would be diatoms. Their, their cell walls are made of silicon dioxide. Uh, silicon dioxide is not actually too dissimilar from glass. Um, it's a hard substance, and um, these would be microscopic um, crystalline cell walls that are made out of the substance. Their hard cell walls will actually last long after the diatom is dead, kind of like a seashell will last long after the, uh, the bivalve that lived in it died. Large numbers of diatom cell walls that are deposited in solid, um, they will form what's called a diatomite or diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth is actually uh, quite useful as an abrasive so the idea being, if you had some soil containing a lot of these uh, cell walls of dead diatoms, if you rubbed it in your hands, all those tiny sharp crystals would end up making tiny abrasions. Basically, it's like sandpaper dirt. 
I know diatomaceous earth sounds a lot more intelligent than sandpaper dirt, but you know, I'm trying to teach you, you guys. So yeah, let's move on. Um, here are some images of diatoms. They come in such a wide variety of shapes, um, even of some sizes. If you wanted to just Google pictures of diatoms, you're going to get all these really crazy kaleidoscopic geometric pictures. It's really a feast for the eyes, but we're going to move on. There's some more out of Phylum chrysophyta. Here's genus Denobrian. Um, there's an alternate spelling, um, depending on whether you're going to look it up, because, you know, of course you will. Um, they form colonies with holdfasts. Uh, that's a cellular structure that allows cells to anchor to surfaces or other cells. Um, yeah, there you go. A special structure used by an organism to anchor itself. Um, a sessile colony is a colony that uses holdfasts to anchor itself to an object. So that picture on the right there, um, all those denobrians, that would be a sessile colony because they're all anchored to each other with holdfasts. Okay, we've got a different phylum now. This is phylum periphyta. Um, and these have two flagella, so they are called dinoflagellates. And um, some of them are heterotrophic. Some of them are photosynthetic. Remember, heterotrophic means that they would um, eat something other than uh, it would not produce its own food. It would eat something. But um, there's a variety within this phylum. You've got some that eat, some that photosynthesize. They mostly live in marine waters. That would be ocean waters. Um, here is a picture of a red tide. So a red tide is caused when gymnodinium brevis algae will bloom. Remember an algal bloom. That is when the algae growth just overwhelms um, an environment. And it will color the water red like themselves. Um, these blooms are deadly to fish because they release toxins into the water. Um, some shellfish are immune to red, uh, to red tides, but still they carry the poison and shouldn't be eaten. So if there's some shellfish that lived through a red tide, it would have ingested those poisons. And if you were to eat that shellfish, you'd get contaminated with that poison as well. Okay, so here's Phylum Firefighter. I love saying that name because it sounds like I'm talking about a New York City firefighter. Firefighter. So uh, this has 1,500 species of multicellular organisms. And uh, that picture on the right, uh, we're not looking at the fish, obviously. We're looking at um, the, the big green thing. They prefer cold marine water. And some varieties are called brown algae. Their cell walls contain alginic acid, or I'm sorry, alginic acid, or algin, which is a useful thickener. Um, if you look on the ingredients lists of some things that would take a thickener, for example, ice cream, I believe, you might see algin or alginic acid. It might just say thickener and not specify what it is, but this is a common thickener. So we've got genus Macrocystis, which would include kelp and seaweed. Obviously, that's what that's a picture of on the right. Um, we've also got genus Fucus. That's called rockweed. These things are difficult to pronounce. Please don't mess that one up. Um, they also have air bladders that permit these algae to float. So the last phylum that we're going to talk about today is called phylum Rhodophyta. Uh, Roto means red or rosy, so there you get the color. They are red in color, so they are not to be confused with dinoflagellates, which also have a red color. They are multicellular, and they prefer warm marine water. Phyophyta preferred cold marine water. These prefer warm marine water. And one example out of Rhodophyta would be the genus Coralina. Coralina Officinalis resembles coral even to the touch. You see the picture on the right, um, that red scrubby coral looking thing really looks like coral. It looks like something that you'd find um, either scuba diving or in the bottom of like a tropical fish tank. That is not a coral. That is a um, multicellular protist. We've also got genus Hildenbrandia. And... Um, 
I mean, you know, I could spend hours and days and weeks talking about all of them, but we've got to cut it off somewhere. So that's where we're going to stop. That is algae.